All right, are there any questions? Otherwise, I think it's time to get started with today's lecture. So today we are going to, so by the time, hopefully by the time we finish today's lecture, you will know what proteins are made of, all right? What lipids are made of, uh, what uh, DNA and RNA are made of, all right? What these different sugars are made of, all right? So if you look at a typical cell, you know, or, or it, this is an important distinction, distinction between organic chemistry and inorganic chemistry, is that the molecules that you encounter in organic chemistry or in the chemistry of living, living organisms are really what are called macromolecules. They are huge in size, okay? It's not going to be like sodium chloride. It's going to be something with a huge formula, okay? So cells contain four major families of small organic molecules or modular units which are combined together to form these large macromolecules. So although you have huge molecules, all right, in, in, in living organisms you encounter huge molecules, but, but these are made up of smaller modular units, right? And we will focus attention on the four important classes of modular units. One class of uh, molecules are what are called sugars, which are the building blocks for more complex sugars and carbohydrates, and we'll get to that in a moment. Then we'll also look at fatty acids, which are the building blocks for fats, lipids, and all cell membranes. Then we look at amino acids, which are the building blocks for proteins. And then we look at nucleotides, which are the building blocks for nucleic acids, such as DNA and RNA. Right. So that's what we are going to consider in this, cha in this chapter. OK, now if you're looking at sugars, the simplest sugars, and they're called monosaccharides, these are compounds with this general formula, CH2O and then N, where N is usually 3, 4, 5, 6, or 7. Okay. So because it contains the carbon, this is C and then H2O, so it's a carbohydrate, okay? So sugars are also called carbohydrates because of this general formula, right? Now, these sugars, all right, that have this general formula with N equal to three, four, five, six, or seven, they are called monosaccharides, okay? And they usually occur as aldehydes or ketones. Recall in the last chapter, we talked about aldehydes, okay? R, C, double bonded with O, and then H, okay? We talked about ketones, C double bonded with O. Okay, we didn't do it just for the fun of it. The, the thing is that the sugars that you're going to encounter in biology, right, they usually occur as aldehydes or ketones. And I'll give you examples of that on the next slide and beyond. So of particular interest to us from the point of view of molecular biology are the five carbon sugars and the six carbon sugars. So here you had CH2O and then N could be any number. If N is five, that's a five carbon sugar. Right, or a pento or what is called a pentose, all right, five carbon sugar. If N is six, then that would be a six carbon sugar or hexose. All right. So if you look at pentoses, all right, there are again two different forms, all right. There could be more too, but the, the two that are of interest are this one, ribose, all right, which is an aldehyde. So see you have the C double bonded with O and then H group here. Somebody asked me last time what was the a group, an organic group. This is a, this can be another organic group, okay? Because remember, in the case of aldehydes, we had R, C double bonded with O and H, and R was an organic group, okay? So an organic group could be something as big as this, right? So here, the general formula for this one is C H two O N equal to five. So that's C five H ten O five, okay? And and this has the, has the name ribose, and it's an aldehyde. The same one. Right, the same sugar, right, you could have a different, with the same molecular formula, could have a different structural formula. And this time it takes the form of a ketone, right? Ketone, again, if you remember from the last lecture, ketone is characterized by the presence of what is called the carbonyl group, or C double bonded with O. There's an organic, some organic group in here and another organic group in here, okay? So C double bonded with O, R1 connected on one side, R2 connected on the other. Right, so this is a, an example of a ketone, and this particular one is called ribulose. Right, and you can have examples of, you know, uh, monosaccharides having the aldehyde and ketone forms for many different values of n, but our primary interest here is for n equal to five and n equal to six. Okay, n equal to five gives you pentoses, and pentoses are the ones that are the sugars that appear in DNA and RNA. N equal to six will give you glucose, and glucose is something that you know the utility of that. Okay, if you're an athlete or you know that we get most of our energy from glucose. So for N equal to six, that's a six carbon sugar or a hexose. And the aldehyde form, again, C double bonded with OH, and then all of this stuff here, that is called glucose. On the other hand, if it is a ketone, C double bonded with O, then that's called fructose, right?
Now, the five carbon sugar ribose, right, that I showed you, the, the aldehyde with, with five carbons, right, and its derivative deoxyribose, which I'll define in a few minutes, right, these are important constituents of nucleic acids such as DNA and RNA, right. DNA, again, somebody pointed out last time, is the abbreviation for deoxyribonucleic acid. RNA is the abbreviation for ribonucleic acid, right. And these are, DNA and RNA, they contain some sugars, okay. If it is DNA, it's going to be deoxyribose. If it's RNA, it's going to be ribose. And regarding glucose, right, the six carbon sugar that is called glucose, it serves as an important source of energy, right, in all living organisms, right. Because we get a lot of our energy by basically from the oxidation of glucose, right. If the level of glucose in your blood falls too low, then you're in trouble, you know, you'll pass out. All right, any questions? Next, I want to point, you, point out something to you about ring formation uh, in, in these organic compounds, in these sugars, okay? So, if, so ring formation of these sugars, these five and six carbon sugars in aqueous solution. See, the inside of the cell is watery, as I said before. Right? It's an aqueous solution. The boundary is made up of lipids. That's oily, all right? So in aqueous solution, what happens is that the aldehyde or the ketone group of a sugar molecule tends to react with the hydroxyl group of the same molecule, thereby closing the molecule into a ring, right? And let me go back to that, to that picture. So this is for ribose, right? Let's go back to the picture where we showed a ribose, and let's see how the ring is formed, right? So this is ribose, the five-carbon sugar. All right, you no number the carbons like this, one, two, three, four, five, right? Now, here you have the aldehyde group, C double bonded with O and H, okay? What is going to happen is that in aqueous solution, all right, this thing here is going to come and bond here, okay? So the oxygen will connect this carbon to that fourth carbon here, okay? And uh, the hydrogen gets removed, you know, it's absorbed in the water, right? That connection happens and then this guy here, the carbon number five, along with the two hydrogens and the hydroxyl group is going to stick out. So this whole thing is going to be connected, let's say in the plane of this, board, right? Whereas this thing will be sticking out, okay? And that's what I'm showing in that diagram over there. So that one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, that's the labeling, okay, in that ring compound. So in aqueous solution, this will form a ring compound, right? And, and, and the same thing is true for, for the case of glucose, because then you have one, two, three, four, five, there'll be a ring formation, the oxygen will come here, the hydroxyl will move onto this, onto this guy, right? And then the CH2OH is going to stick out of the plane of the board. Right. That's what we are trying to show in that picture. Right. So in aqueous solution, and, and you know, in, in most books on biochemistry, even in medicine and all, you will see this structure. When they show ribose, it will be this structure because it is an aqueous solution. So there is a ring compound that is formed. See here, you can see one, two, three, four. I said one and four would get connected with that oxygen, right? And then hydroxyl sticking out, and then CH2OH, containing the five car uh, carbon, that's going to stick out of the plane of the of this board. So this is what ribose would look like in aqueous solution, right? Similarly, if you're looking at glucose, the six carbon sugar, again, one, two, three, four, five, right? The fifth carbon is connected to the first carbon through this oxygen, right? Hydroxyl sticking out here, and then CH2OH containing the six carbon is sticking out of this of this plane, right? So since the environment inside a cell is aqueous, it is this ring structure that you're going to be encounter over and over again, not only in this course. If you, you open any book on biochemistry, right, it's going to have this structure, right? It's not going to have the other aldehyde structure, right? Or even, you know, books pertaining to medicine and all will also have this, okay? And glucose uh, is extremely, extremely important, right, F from the medical point of view. Yes, sir. Six what? Six of carbons on the ring. I mean, so the last one is not going to stick out, but it's on the ring also. So uh, yeah, yeah, it's possible. It's possible, but again, I have to give you like because I have not looked into that. So you, you're saying with seven, yeah, because we said that seven was also an allowed number for a monosaccharide. It's possible, but I just don't know whether it exists or not. Okay, it is possible, and in fact, here also there will be. See, like, this is glucose, right? What, what happens if you go and interchange the hydrogen and, and the, you know, hydroxyl? You'll get a different compound, 
Okay. In organic chemistry, if the structure is different, it will have different properties. I'll give you a couple of examples of that. Okay. So instead of glucose, it will be some other sugar. Okay. Like it, it could be galactose. All right. I, I forget which one. Either it's number two or number four. If you interchange the hydrogen and hydroxyl, you get a different sugar. All right. So there are, the possibilities are endless. But again, in this course, we are just trying to get the basics to get us to genomic signal processing. So we are not delving into that. But if you, if you are going to med school, they would spend a lot of time. Okay. Or if you are in the biology department. All right, any other questions? So, yeah, we got to your, no, actually not your question, but we'll get to, get to that, the answer to your question. Okay, please come in. Now, we have talked about ribose. Ribose is a five-carbon sugar, one, two, three, four, five, right? And it has this structure in aqueous solution. Now, you will notice that I have put one prime, two prime, three prime, four prime, and five prime here. Okay, I didn't put one, two, three, four, five, okay? There is a reason for this, because most, most of the times that you're working with this ribose or deoxyribose, all right, it is going to be as part of a DNA or RNA molecule, okay? So the sugar is only part of the, of, of the, uh, of the mix, you know, you need some other compound, all right, some molecule plus a sugar plus a phosphate to get your DNA or RNA, all right? And that first molecule, okay, which is a nitrogen-containing compo ring compound, that takes up the Lettering one, two, three, four, five, six. You know, it can even go up to nine. You will see that by the time we get done with this lecture. So that's why when you're labeling the sugar, usually you will put one prime, two prime, three prime, four prime, five prime. Okay, that's what you will see in all in many, many different textbooks, even medical books also. When they are writing the sugar, they will not write with one, two, three, four, five. They'll write with one prime, two prime, three prime, four prime, and five prime. Okay. So just some notation I'm letting you know. But we'll encounter that later on. Now, if you start with ribose, all right. And here you have a hydroxyl group at the two prime location, all right? If you replace this hydroxyl group with hydrogen, that means you have taken away oxygen from this guy, okay? Then you get a new sugar, which is called deoxyribose, okay? So the only difference between this and this is that instead of a hydroxyl group, you have a hydrogen. Oxygen has been taken away. This is deoxyribose. This is the sugar that is found in DNA, okay? Whether it's from you, from me, for any, from any, any animal, okay? It is, it is this sugar that is found, okay? And, and that, this is one of the things that contributes to the terminology um, deoxyribonucleic acid for DNA, okay? because this sugar is deoxyribose. If it is RNA, RNA is ribonucleic acid, the sugar is going to be ribose. It is not going to be deoxyribose. Important difference between DNA and RNA. And again, we are going to be encountering it again in this chapter, and later on there is a, an entire chapter that is de devoted to DNA. So, you know, this is, this is a theme that will run, and it will give you more opportunities to, you know, kind of master the biology or at least pick up all the terminology and all that, okay? But you have to keep on studying as I, you know, make progress in the lecture, you know, there's no time to relax. So this is a ribose and that's deoxyribose, right? Now, another thing that we have to understand is that in inorganic chemistry, right, quite often when you just get the chemical formula, that's the end of the story because there's only one possible structure for that compound, right? A unique structural formula. In organic chemistry, on the other hand, compounds, Having the same chemical formula may have totally different structural formula and properties, all right? And compounds which have the same chemical formula but different structural formula are called isomers of each other. And organic chemistry is filled with instances of isomers whose different properties make them especially well suited for particular biological functions. Like, see, even in the food that you eat, okay, you're taking in certain molecules, right? You have, you know, the necessary enzymes to process these molecules. If somebody gives you exactly the same molecular formula for something that has the structure, a different structural formula, right, you probably die because you cannot process that, okay. That is the reason, for example, why cows, right, they can eat grass and survive, okay. If we go and eat grass, we don't have the enzymes to metabolize, you know, we'll probably die, okay, or, or end up in the emergency unit or, or hospital or ICU, you know, whatever. And, you know, the, the cows and some of these other animals, you know, they will have the enzymes, the necessary chemicals that are needed to change one isomer into another, okay, where the body can process it. So a few examples of isomers, and that gets to your question. For example, if we interchange the hydrogen and the hydroxyl group at carbon number four in glucose, right, we obtain a, and you don't have to memorize all this, okay, you're not a student of biology, but this is just for your information. We obtain a different sugar, which is called galactose, right, and this is the sugar that actually goes into the production of milk, all right? Milk has lactose, that is lactose composed with, uh, combined with glucose, will give you lactose. And I'll show you how they link up, all right? Another example, if we interchange the hydrogen and the hydroxyl groups at carbon number two in glucose, we obtain the sugar that is called mannose, okay? And there are, there are lots and lots of examples 
no your double e students no memorization is required okay but you have to know be aware that these things are there yeah go ahead Uh, isomer means it's the same mole molecular formula, right? But different structural formula. The the formula for the compound is exactly the same. Like if it's glucose, it's C6H12O6, okay? But then you can have many different forms. How the uh, elements are arranged, right? How the atoms are arranged in that molecule are going to be different, okay? All right, so we talked about monosaccharides or the simplest sugars that had the general formula CH2ON where n was like 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. Now, we want to see how these units of sugar all right, are linked together to form, let's say, disaccharides, if you have two monosaccharides linked together. Trisaccharides, if three of them, then you can have polysaccharides also. Right? So the monosaccharide building blocks can be combined together to yield more complex sugars. Right? Disaccharides are made up of two monosaccharides that are linked together in a condensation reaction. Okay? Condensation reactions are reactions where you know, two units are linked together and a water molecule is eliminated. So say for example you have some sugar here, another sugar here, monosaccharides. And you know that at all these different locations you have hydrogen and, and hydroxyl groups sticking on. Right? So between these two guys you can, get a, you can eliminate a water molecule, right, H2O, and you'll have an oxygen linking these two guys together. Right? Now you've got a disaccharide that has got two sugars that are linked together. Okay? Guess what? This can be continued because there are hydroxy, hydrogen and hydroxyl groups elsewhere. Okay? You can link up more. Even, not only that, it doesn't even have to be a straight chain. It could be a branch chain. You might have a linkage here, then another one here, another one here, and you, know, you can have all kinds of weird shapes. All right? I mean, that's the reason why organic chemistry is so difficult all right? because there are so many possibilities. Okay? So since there are many hydroxyl groups on each monosaccharide, two monosaccharides can link together in many different ways. And then due to the availability of additional hydroxyl groups on the disaccharide, more monosaccharides can get linked to it, producing chains and branches of various lengths. If these are short chains, they are called oligosaccharides, while long chains are called polysaccharides. Right? An example of a polysaccharide is glycogen. Right, which is made up entirely of glucose units that are linked together. Right? In fact, glycogen st serves as the body's energy reserve. Because you need to have your blood, the level of glucose in your blood, okay, you have, need to have it within limits because, it can, because red blood cells can only use glucose. Right? Your brain needs glucose. Right? If your glucose drops, your brain doesn't get glucose right, for four minutes. Right? Well, oxygen and, and, and glucose, it, can, it doesn't get energy, you are brain dead. Okay? Yeah, and, and we don't know how to, you know, revive somebody that is brain dead. You know, your organs function, but, but you, 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 you're basically gone. You know, so it's that important. Right? Now, glycogen serves, and the body has mechanisms for, you know, regulating the level of glucose, right, in the blood. It has to be within uh, certain tight limits. But let's say your the level of glucose in your blood goes up. Okay, it's it's too high. You know, then the excess glucose needs to be stored somewhere. It can be stored as glycogen as units, glucose units that are linked together, right? And we all have about one day's uh, reserve of, uh, you know, energy, right, in, stored in the form of glycogen in the body, right, for about a day. But it's not very, com because glucose has got water in it, right? So if, you, if it's stored as glycogen, it's not very compact storage. So first, if you're eating too much, okay, if you're eating more than you're exercising, so your blood glucose is high, so the excess glucose will first get stored as glycogen. But that's only a day's supply of energy. Beyond that, it'll start getting stored in the fat, uh, form of fat, okay? Because no matter how much we dislike fat, right, it is a very efficient storage of energy because it, it, it can store, you know, the same weight of fat will have like about six times as much energy as glucose, all right? So that's an efficient storage mechanism. So after that, it'll store it as, as, as fat in the body, okay? So gl glycogen is an example of a polysaccharide. You know, this glucose, uh, this um, cellulose is an example of a, of a polysaccharide, okay, produced by a plant, right? This wood is a polysaccharide. Now, the kind of reaction that I showed you where two units are, are linked together by the elimination of a water molecule, that's called a condensation reaction. But these reactions are not unique to the formation of sugars from monosaccharides. In fact, they are used to form proteins from amino acids and nucleic acids from nucleotides. In this chapter, I'm going to talk about amino acids and nucleotides, and I will show you how amino acids can be linked together to produce proteins. All right? Nucleotides can be linked together to produce nucle nucleic acids. All right? Now, the, so 
if you have smaller units, you're trying to link them together, produce a larger unit, that's called a condensation reaction, removal of a water molecule. The reverse reaction of condensation is called hydrolysis. Hydro is water and lysis means to split, right? So hydrolysis is splitting with water, right? And this plays an important role in our digestion of carbohydrates and other foods, right? Because if you eat like, complex carbohydrates, that's what you're supposed to eat, right? Maybe not for you guys, you guys are young, you know, but for older people, they'll tell you to eat complex carbohydrates because, you know, that's better for your body. You just, you do not want to have wild swings in your blood glucose, right? It should stay around some, you know, reasonable value, right? So, uh, if, if you have these complex carbohydrates, you know, naturally that's made up of many of these monosaccharides that are linked together. The body can only absorb glucose, right? So these have to be broken down, okay? So there has to have to be hydrolysis re reactions, all right, that break those down into the simpler molecules that the body can absorb, ab absorb, right? And that is, you know, carried out by different enzymes. For example, your saliva has got enzymes that can break down glucose, all right? Then even in your pancreas and other places, you, uh, you know, uh, you have en enzymes that will uh, break down these complex molecules into, uh, you know, simpler molecules that the body can absorb. Because in biology, there's no shortcut, okay? You cannot just eat some meat and immediately put on some muscle or something like that. You know, that has to be broken up in, into, at, at, at the molecular level. Then it has, it has to go through the system, then be absorbed, and then, then you build up muscle. You know? so there are no shortcuts there. Now, some specific examples of disaccharides resulting from linking together two monosaccharide units, and this list is by no means exhaustive. Okay, that's not my goal here. But just to give you an idea, for example, two glucose units can link together to produce maltose. And again, the linkage will have to be at the right location. Okay, I don't know what the location is, whether it's three prime, four prime, five, I don't know. But if you open a book on biochemistry, they'll have that information, right? Or these days, you don't even need to open a book. You just do Google search or go, go to Wikipedia or whatever, and you'll get that information. Glucose and galactose, when they link together, that produces lactose, which is the sugar found in milk, right? That means if you drink milk, right? You have lactose to break down that, so you have to break down that lactose into glucose and galactose, right? For that, you need enzymes, right? And like we have that enzyme that's called lactase, right? And you know, a lot of, I think, people from Asia or something like that, if they're older, they, they develop a uh, lactose intolerance, right? Because you stop producing lactase, right? And then you and try drinking a glass of milk if you're, uh, you know, lactose intolerant, you see how how much fun it is. You know, so. <laughs> Similarly, glucose and fruit, so that tells you, you know, even if you have isomers or you have the, the compounds, if you don't have the right enzyme, then you're in trouble. Glucose plus fructose is sucrose, right? It, it'll give you sucrose if you link the two of them together. Now, one thing I should point out, I think somebody brought this up uh, in the last lecture also about the energy considerations and reactions. These reactions are not energetically favorable because they're gener generating order, right? Glucose plus glucose, you're not breaking down something, you're building up, okay? So for these reactions to take place, you need certain extra factors to, to kick in. These will not happen spontaneously, right? So just keep that in mind and we will uh, see that again in the next chapter. All right, so we finish our discussion of sugars, all right? They're made up of those monosaccharides and we have seen how they get linked up together. The next class of uh, uh, modular units that we are going to look at are what are called fatty acids, right? These are organic acids, all right? Because, you know, we're looking at molecular biology, so these will be, uh, you know, carboxylic acids or organic acids. So a fatty acid molecule has got two distinct regions. It'll have a long hydrocarbon tail, okay? Like here, this is carbon, 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 and hydrogens attached all over, right? So this is a hydrocarbon. We know that hydrocarbon is hydrophobic, right? I mean, because carbon and hydrogen, they attract electrons in a covalent bond to the same degree. So there's no charge distribution. So this thing will hate water. It will not interact with water, right? But on the other hand, the, the fatty acid will also have a carboxyl group, all right? On the other hand, C double bonded with OH. And this is a hydrophilic group, right? Because this likes water. This can dissociate, this portion can dissociate in, in water, right? Or partially dissociate to produce hydrogen ions, right? So it'll have two things, a long hydrocarbon chain, and then a carboxyl group, which behaves as a carboxylic acid, is ionized in solution. That means it gives up its hydrogen ion. And is extremely hydrophilic. It really loves water. So this guy loves water. This one hates water, okay? So that's a fatty acid. And you can have different examples of that. This particular one is palmitic acid. So there will be 16 carbons here. One, two, like that. You count, you know, there should be 16 carbons in here. So C16. And uh, this is what is called a saturated fatty acid. You may have heard of that, right? People talk about you should 
have polyunsaturated fatty acids, right? Again, I'm not of interest to you guys. You having everything, you know, whatever you eat, it, it works out fine. Okay, but for older people, you know, to avoid health problems, they're supposed to have unsaturated fatty acids. So, what do you mean by sat saturated fat fatty acid? Means that all these carbons are linked together only by single bonds. Okay, so there's no room for putting in more more uh, atoms, right? Because everything is linked by single bonds. So. So this is uh, palmitic acid. This is the kind of acid, that, uh, fatty acid that you see in, let's say, coconut, coconut oil, right? That's why it's palmitic acid or a palm or a date palm. So palmitic acid with, with 16 carbons in it is a saturated fatty acid. And saturated fatty acids are characterized by the absence of double bonds between the carbon atoms, right? So next, and there are lots of examples of these, you know, I don't even know, or I don't even care to know the formulas for all, the, all these different uh, you know, fatty acids, you don't need to either, okay, but at least know that what a saturated fatty acid is. And then I give you an example of an unsaturated fatty acid is oleic acid. It has got 18 carbons, all right, and it is unsaturated because you have a pair of carbon atoms. These are all carbon atoms, carbon here, carbon here, carbon here, carbon here. A pair of carbon atoms that are linked together by a double bond, okay. This is oleic acid. So guess uh, in, in what, in, in which, uh, fruit or vegetable or, or whatever, are you going to find oleic acid? Can you guess? Olive oil, yeah. yeah. Olive oil is going to have that, yeah. So, but this has a double bond. So this is an unsaturated fatty acid, okay? And this double bond, remember I said that last time, okay? I think it was last time only, that that creates steric hindrance, right? Because that is not going to allow you to fold things up properly. So that's why this molecule will take a particular shape, right? It's possible that that's what gives it its beneficial effect, you know. So looking at this, you can say that probably this olive oil would be a better thing to consume than going and having palmitic acid because that one is a saturated acid. This is at least unsaturated, right? So maybe this allows something else in the body to process it differently. I don't know. I'm just, you know, making a guess here. All right. Any questions? Now, how are fatty acids you know, stored in the body, okay? Because usually, as I said, you have, if you have excess of energy, that's going to get stored as fat, right, in the body. Right. Now, fatty acids serve as concentrated food reserves in cells, as they can be broken down to produce about six times as much usable energy weight for weight as glucose, okay? So this is really compact storage, right? I mean, so the excess fat that people accumulate, right, is not, it's not that it's nature's purpose to make them look bad or whatever, or, you know, make them not feel good, you know, it's because it is compact, okay? Otherwise, your volume would have to be six times more. Okay? You'd have to be six times bigger to carry the same amount of energy. Right? So fatty acids are usually stored in cells as triacylglycerol molecules, or what are called triglycerides, which consists of three fatty acids joined to a glycerol backbone. So this is a glycerol. It's an alcohol. All right? See, like OH, OH, OH. This is glycerol. If you're looking at a triglyceride or triacylglycerol, what is going to happen is that this hydroxyl group over here is going to link up with a fatty acid. Remember, a fatty acid had the long hydrocarbon chain, then there was a carboxyl group, okay? So between this OH and this OH of the carboxyl group, you can eliminate a water molecule, all right? And you can link this up, up with, the, with, with this first, uh, you know, branch of, the, of, of this uh, glycerol molecule. Then the second one will have another fatty acid, right? So different groups, R R1 could be, this could be, you know, palmitic acid, this could be oleic acid, whatever, okay? This could be yet another, another fatty acid. And if you have a glycerol molecule that is linked up to three fatty acids, that is called a triacylglycerol, or the doctors refer to it as triglycerides. Because if you go and do blood work, they will check your triglycerides level because that tells them how much of fat is swimming around in your blood, okay? Because that has the potential to, you know, go and clog your arteries and things like that. You know? Again, at your age, you don't have to worry about anything, you know, so. But as you get older, those become significant factors. Okay, any questions? So this is the storage of, of fats as triglycerides. Next, I also want to talk about what are called phospholipids and glycoly glycolipids, all right? So if you're, so again, the starting point is the glycerol molecule, all right? If you're looking at a phospholipid, you will have a fatty acid that will get attached to the first location, fatty acid to the second location, and it's a phospholipid, so there'll be some phosphate group along with some, some hydrophilic group, something that loves water attached, okay? Now, what is the net result? The net result is that this looks like a molecule that has got two parts because there's a fatty acid tail here, 
which is a hydrocarbon tail. Okay, so it hates water. This one hates water. Okay, this guy loves water. All right, remember I showed on the first day, I showed that picture. All right, that there there were two two portions. That, there was a molecule. All right, that had a head that really loved water, and then there were the two tails that hated water. All right, I showed you that. That's basically this. Okay. I didn't I didn't come up with those numbers two and one j just for the fun of it. You know, it, it. This is how it occurs in nature. Okay, so if it's a phospholipid. This third one is going to be a phosphate attached to some hydroph hydrophilic group. If it is a glycolipid, then it's going to be some sugar that sugar which which really likes water, right? That that'll get attached here, right? So phospholipids are the major constituents of cell membranes. In phospholipids, two of the hydroxyl groups in glycerol are linked to fatty acids, while the third hydroxyl group is linked to phosphoric acid, right? And this is a schematic diagram for a typical phospholipid. And you can, I mean, and this is something that we already discussed, all right? Uh, how a fatty acid can be used to form a surface film and a micelle, all right? So, since a fatty acid possesses a hydrophilic part and a hydrophobic part, it's an amphipathic molecule, it can form a surface film or small micelles, okay? So if you put water and you just scatter some fatty acid, the part that loves water will stay in contact with the water, the part that hates water will stay away from it, you will have a film like this, all right? This is what happens when you try to mix up oil and water, all right? The oil is on top and it's, it's staying like this. Uh, similarly, you can form what are called uh, micelles, okay, where, you know, there is this, uh, it, this is like a bubble, okay, where the, the exterior is hydrophilic, all right, and all the portion that hates water is staying away from it, okay. And this is actually like if you, if you talk about, uh, uh, you know, like how, how uh, because, see, we need to, See, our blood is actually aqueous solution, okay? It's watery, all right? But then fats have to be moved around, right? So usually fats are encapsulated in this form, all right? Into something that is called a chylomicron, all right? And then it can move around because now the outside is watery, okay? You have fat inside and it'll go to the relevant tissue. Maybe you need to build up some fat over there or some, you know, fat is needed for cell membranes and so on, okay? So that's how the transportation takes place, all right? So another example is the formation of the lipid bilayer, which I dis discussed in the first chapter. So because of similar reasons, the phospholipids and glycolipids, which are lipids made up of two fatty acids for the hydrophobic part and one or more sugar residues for the hydrophilic part, they form these self-sealing lipid bilayers, which are the basis for all cellular membranes. So again, the two hydrophobic tails, a hydrophilic head in an aqueous environment, right? This will form, this whole thing will become like a bilayer where the hydrophilic part is facing the water, all right? Hydrophobic part is staying away from the water. If you go and try to mess it up, you put it, you stick a needle in, right? It'll create an opening. But when you take the needle out again, it's a self-sealing membrane, right? That's pretty nice, right? How many things seal by themselves? Not too many. If you break something, it doesn't fix itself automatically. Here, it does have the ability to do that. All right, any questions? So we already covered sugars, all right? We also covered fatty acids, all right? So next, we are going to start looking at amino acids, which are the building blocks of proteins. So before I start on that, any questions on, on whatever we have covered so far? Now, amino acids are the subunits of proteins. They possess both, it's called amino because it's an amino acid. So there will be an amino group somewhere, there will be a carboxyl group somewhere, okay? That's why it's an amino acid. So amino acids are the subunits of proteins. They possess both a carboxylic acid group and an amino group both linked to a single carbon atom called the alpha carbon. So here you have this single carbon atom that's called the alpha carbon. On one end, you have this amino group. NH2 is the amino group. On the other end, you have the carboxyl group, C double bonded with O, H, all right? Carboxyl group. And then you have a hydrogen atom, and then you have something here that is called the side chain group, all right? So all the amino acids will have this structure. The, the difference between the different amino acids will come in the choice of this side chain group, all right? This, this R will be different for different amino acids, okay? And, you know, you're all engineers. You know, if I have amino acids linked together, okay, let's say 20 amino acids, right? In each location, I have possibilities for 20 different amino acids, okay? So if I have a chain that is 100 units long, all right? So the number of different compounds that you can come up with is like 20 to the power of 100, okay? Really large number, right? Many, many possibilities, right? So amino acids are the subunits of proteins. They possess both a carboxylic acid group and an amino group, both linked to a single carbon atom called the alpha carbon. 
amino acids differ from each other because of the different side chains, these guys, Rs, that are also attached to the alpha carbon. And a typical amino acid has the following structural formula. Right? Now, if you look at any living organism, right, it will have amino acids right, with 20 different possible side chains. Okay? For all life on this planet will have amino acids where, where R will be one of those 20 possibilities. Okay? If you have life on some other planet and it is amino acid based, you might have additional side chains, okay? but that's not been discovered so far. Okay. And, and these things actually point to a common ancestor too. Okay? I mean, like if all, even the hu from the simplest bacterium to humans, okay, if you have the same amino acids, okay? But it's the, it's the different combinations that will make the, the functions different, okay? Of, of the different proteins. Okay, now I give you a listing of, you know, the different possibilities for the side chains. Again, you don't have to memorize anything, but, you know, if you open a book on uh, organic chemistry, molecular biology, they will give you the detailed structure, you know? what those R's are, the individual R groups, they will put out the detailed structures, okay? I'll just summarize that. So first, you have basic side chains, okay? That means you'll, the side chain that you're going to have, that R is going to have basic properties. So these side chains usually contain a nitrogen atom or an amino group. We know that amino group is a basic group because it reduces the hydrogen ion concentration in solution, okay? It'll take up a hydrogen ion to form the ammonium ion, okay? We, we know that, okay? I already discussed that before. So these are basic side chains. So examples of amino acids with basic side chains are lysine, arginine, and histidine. And for us right now, all that is Greek, okay? Because if you open a book, again, if you open a book on molecular biology or even for uh, books that people that go to medical school use, they will give you the detailed structure, okay? If you're a molecular biology student, you would need to know what the detailed structure is, right? Then you can have acidic side chains where you, the, in the side chain, you will have another carboxyl group, right? So examples of acidic side chains are if R is CH2COOH, so you can see this is a carboxylic acid, right? Then you have what is called aspartic acid, right? It's an amino acid, but it, it's called aspartic acid or aspartate. Another example is if you have R equal to C2H4COOH, then this uh, particular amino acid is called glutamic acid or glutamate, right? Then yet another possibility would be to have uncharged polar side chains, right? So these amino acids contain a hydrophilic side chain containing an amino group or a hydroxyl group. And examples of amino acids with, with uncharged polar side chains are asparagine, glutamine, serine, threonine, and tyrosine, right? And you can count. If you count all these names, you'll see there are 20 of them, like three here, then two here, right? Then another one, two, three, four, five here, right? And then count the rest, you'll see there, there are only 20 different uh, side chains, okay? Then the last one, these are nonpolar side chains. These side chains contain hydrocarbons, right? Nonpolar, these are like hydrocarbons, carbon and hydrogen. Remember again, carbon and hydrogen attract electrons to the same degree. So carbon hydrogen covalent bond is nonpolar, right? It's not going to mix with water. So these side chains contain hydrocarbons and are usually hydrophobic or nonpolar. And examples of amino acids with nonpolar side chains are alanine, valine, leucine, isoleucine, proline, phenylalanine, methionine, tryptophan, glycine, and cysteine. And, you know, there are 20 different amino acids. I'm just going to list the structure for just one of them on the next slide. Okay. And if you're interested in more structures, you can go and look, look at the books. Even if you type this, maybe even on, your, on the internet, it will show you the structure. So this is a representative amino acid. This is called cysteine, right? So, so this is the amino group. This is the carboxyl group. This is the hydrogen connected to the alpha carbon. And then this is the side chain. Notice that this side chain has got sulfur in it, okay? So in fact, if you have two of these guys, they can link together, okay? The side chains can link together because the two sulfur elements can link together and the hydrogen can be eliminated, okay? Inside the cell, that is not going to happen because inside the cell, it's an aqueous environment. So you have a lot of hydrogen atoms or hydrogen ions moving around, right? But when it's outside the cell, you, you could have units link up together, 16 units link up together like this. So disulfide bonds can form between two cysteine side chains and can play an important role in determining the three-dimensional shape of the protein containing these cysteines. Okay. So if you have something that has cysteine inside the cell and it's exported from the cell, outside the cell there isn't that much of hydrogen, so you might have disulfide bonds that might actually cement the shape of that, of, of that protein. Right. But again, I mean, this is something that we are going to encounter uh, later on in the chapter on, on proteins. Now, in this chapter, the important thing to note is that you have this amino acid with an amino group at one end and a carboxyl group at the other. 
you can take two different amino acids, okay? Link the amino group of, of one with the carboxyl group of the next one, right? Through a condensation reaction, and you, you have produced, you know, two amino acids that are linked together, right? You can continue the process, right? And that's how you build up proteins. So amino acids can be linked to each other via peptide bonds, which are essentially amide linkages. Again, that's the reason why I introduced those amide linkages uh, last, in the last lecture, okay? When I talked about you know, uh, alcohols and carboxylic acid reacting together to produce uh, an ester, okay? One example of an ester is an amide linkage. So you, you can look at this picture here. You have amino acid number one with side group R1, or, or side chain R1. Amino acid number two with side chain R2. You have the amino group of this guy and the carboxyl group of this guy. Between the two of them, a water molecule is eliminated. And then you have this C double bonded with O is linked up with NH, and you have this peptide bond. Okay, you can continue the process, and this has been this is a condensation reaction because the reaction was achieved through the elimination of a water molecule. Right now, even after you've done the first linkage, now again I still have an amino group over here, right, a carboxyl group here. So I can do it again. I can link use uh, link up the amino group of the next amino acid with, the, with this carboxyl unit and continue the chain. Okay, and it can be very long, right? So if you're looking at a protein, which is basically a, a bunch of amino acids that are linked together by peptide bonds, on one end, you will have an, what is called the amino terminus or the N terminus right, of the protein. On the, so it has a very definite polarity. And on the other end, you're going to have the carboxyl terminus or the C terminus of the protein. So here, when we are linking up amino acids, we have a well-defined directionality, an amino group at one end and a carboxyl group on the other. It is possible to attach additional amino acids to the existing chain via further condensation reactions. And the final chain that you have will, uh, will also have an amino group at one end that's called the amino terminus or the N-terminus, and a carboxyl group at the other called the carboxyl terminus or the C-terminus. Right, and uh, this is the same picture that is repeated here. Amino terminus on one side, carboxyl terminus on the other, and then there is this peptide bond. Okay, and these two guys, C and C, are the two alpha carbons coming from the two amino acids that we have linked together. Now, the four atoms inside this block, right, the C, N, O, and H, they form a rigid planar unit so that there is no ro rotation about the carbon nitrogen bond. Okay, that's just the way it is. You cannot rotate this carbon and nitrogen relative to each other. However, the two bonds that are linking the alpha carbons, this C here to this one and this one, they allow rotation. So the long chains of amino acids are very, very flexible. Right? You can rotate it. And you know, I mean, being engineering students, that you know, things always move towards the conformation of lowest energy. Right? So this will fold up. If you have a bunch of different amino acids with different side chains, this thing will fold up based on many different considerations. Okay? The effect of all the different factors will, will be summed together, right, in some nonlinear fashion. That will give you your final shape for the protein. Okay? And that is what is going to determine the function of the protein, whether it functions properly or not. So since uh, polypeptides can be of any length, and e at each location we can have one out of 20 possible amino acids, 20 possible side chains, there is an enormous variety of proteins that can be synthesized using peptide bonds between amino acids. Okay? But biologically, the, the proteins, the useful proteins are the ones that have a fixed three-dimensional conformation, okay? You do not want something that falls, you know, today in some shape and tomorrow in some other shape, okay? That's not, like, if, if you're looking at hemoglobin in the blood, that has got exactly the right shape, okay? Exactly the right shape for binding oxygen, for, for, its, for the job that it is designed to do, picking up oxygen from the lungs, taking it to the tissues for cellular respiration. It has exactly that right shape. In fact, Hemoglobin is made up of two units. There's an alpha unit and a beta subunit, right? The beta subunit is made up of 146 different amino acids. If you go and change one of those amino acids, okay, just one, right, that's enough to mess up the hemoglobin completely, right? And if your hemoglobin is completely messed up, you're dead, basically. So, so you know, there are many different possibilities, you know, but only the, the, one, the ones which you see in nature, those are the proteins that, that have got unique shape, right? That means they will sh fold in, into, into a particular shape that is needed for their function, right? If you change the shape a little bit, 
you know what happens for example you know we are all alive because we have functional hemoglobin okay let's say one of us doesn't have functional hemoglobin what is going to happen okay, you're going to die you're going to get eliminated from the population so what we are seeing right now is basically what works right in living organisms right okay and there will be a detailed chapter all right on uh, these uh, proteins all right there is in fact it's probably one of the longest chapters in the book so we will encounter this again you know so in in this chapter we are just trying to lay the key concepts all right and the building blocks and try to get gain some understanding and more detailed treatment is coming so the, a, any questions so far so we talked about sugars all right then we talked about amino acids we talked about fatty acids all right the last set of modular building blocks that we want to look at are what are called nucleotides these are the subunits of nucleic acids such as dna and rna a nucleotide is a molecule which is made up of a nitrogen containing compound which is linked to a five carbon sugar that's a pentose right it could be either ribose or deoxyribose and this is going to carry one or more phosphate groups the nitrogen containing ring compounds these are called the bases of dna and rna or, or of nucleic acids they are of two types they're pyrimidines and purines right so so there are two types if if it has a six member ring label like this remember i told you earlier that you know the 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 numbers without primes are taken up by these guys right so the sugar will have primes on it the the carbon in the sugar so here this is a pyrimidine a six carbon a six member ring or you could have a nine member ring that's called a, that would be called a purine right now among so next i give you examples of pyrimidines and purines so if you are looking at pyrimidines there are three of them one of them is called cytosine that has this structure again this is a six member ring six member ring six member ring this is cytosine c okay uracil u denoted by u thymine denoted by t you don't have to memorize all of them if you want to you know you can right that's up to you right but i mean i think it would be difficult i would like to point out that for example thymine all right it is basically five methyl uracil if you look at uracil here at location number 5 you put a methyl group ch3 right then you got thymine so there is a relationship between them you know again you don't need to delve deep into this except know that pyrimidines are these uh, six member ring compounds okay you have cytosine uracil and thymine c and t okay they occur in dna u occurs in rna okay so these are pyrimidines then in addition to that you have things that are called purines where you have a nine member ring right so the a is a purine this is adenine that's called a purine guanine is also a purine right and again if you want to remember this i took this class i mean i was sitting in on a class at anm okay where they were teaching about this and some students said they remember this by saying ags are pure you know if that helps you remember that adenine and guanine are purine you know feel free to use that you know you may believe or you may not believe it ags are pure apparently so but again i mean if it is dna you will have a g c t okay if it is rna you will have a g c is common between dna and rna but instead of t you will have uracil or u right so the first component of dna rna all right or nucleic acid would be those bases a g c t u okay the next component is this five carbon sugar if it is ribose if it is rna then the sugar is going to be ribose okay whose structure we just studied 1 prime 2 prime 3 prime 4 prime 5 prime this is ribose or you take out the oxygen from the second location you get deoxyribose okay so this is the sugar that will be present in 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 dna this one is in rna okay there is one more thing missing so it's a base sugar and then there is a phosphate group right there's a reason why we put in the phosphate and we talked about phosphoanhydride bonds and things like that okay not just for the fun of it you know I and mean, because this is an entire field i wouldn't be pulling things out and putting it here you know because there's an entire field over there you know why should i just put things here for the fun of it you know i have to be selective only whatever is needed here is covered in this class so so the third component is the inorganic phosphate ion so here you example for example if you have c okay it could be anything it could be a g c t u okay whatever you like c here cytosine then you have this five carbon sugar in this case we are using ribose so let's say it is an rna molecule that we are trying to construct ribose and then there is a phosphate so how is the linkage done right well the one prime here is going to link up to this low one location on the base see that one prime here is linked up to that end okay you take this sugar stick it in here right okay 
I mean, whatever, water molecule is eliminated, whatever is done, but this now is linked to that nitrogen at the bottom, right? Then you have the five prime end of the sugar sticking out, right? Attach, this is CH2OH, again, attach this inorganic phosphate here, because there's a hydroxyl, CH2OH, you can eliminate a water molecule, you can form this phosphoester bond, right? Okay. So this gives you one unit, right? It's called a nucleoside. This is the unit from which DNA or RNA is built, right? This is one unit. So how are you going to build up a sequence? Okay, you basically connect these units end to end. And where are the ends going to be? One is this five prime end, right? The other end. So this has a polarity. There's a five prime end with this phosphate. There's a three prime end with the hydroxyl group, right? So the way you link it up is this is one unit. Let's say it has a C. Another one might have a G, okay? Another one might have a T. Way you link it up is that this phosphate group from the next unit will come and link up over here, all right? This already has one ester bond, phosphoester bond, okay? When this, when, when this unit from the, uh, this uh, phosphate unit from the, from the next uh, uh, block comes and links up here, you will have two ester bonds, okay? So it will become a phosphodiester bond, all right? And that's how it will get linked together. So, and again, this chain can be continued because I have a phosphate on one end at the five prime, the other end, I have a hydroxyl group with three primes sticking out. Okay, and you can keep on linking. And then this thing will generate the sequence, the C, G, T, whatever, that is the DNA sequence. The rest of it is the sugar phosphate backbone. And again, if you didn't get the complete picture right now, you know, just be patient. We, are, we have an entire chapter that is devoted to DNA. So I will talk about this in more detail. But I think I did try to explain clearly how the linkage will take place. This is one end, okay? This is the other, all right? So the, the phosphate of the next molecule will come and link up here. So again, now you have two units linked together, phosphate on one end, hydroxyl on the other. Again, you can link up more units, and that's how you can. And if you look at the human genome, if you look at any of our cells, there are three billion of these guys that are linked together. That is producing DNA, all right? And the difference between DNA and RNA is if it is, if it is DNA, this will be A, G, C, T, all right? If it is RNA, it will be A, G, C, U, all right? If it is DNA, this sugar is going to be Deoxyribose means this oxygen will not be there, all right? Or if it is RNA, it will be just ribose, which is basically what you have right here. So nucleic acids are formed by stringing nucleotide units together. If the sugar is deoxyribose and the bases are AGCT, we have deoxyribonucleic acid or DNA. Sugar is ribose and uh, the bases are AGCU, then we have ribonucleic acid or RNA. And as I said, this topic will be treated in detail in a later chapter, right? And I just want to, uh, you know, state a few facts and then we, uh, you know, dismiss for today. So in addition to serving as the building blocks for DNA and RNA, nucleotides have many other functions. They can serve as storehouses of chemical energy and I will elaborate on that in a later chapter. They can combine with other groups to form activated ca carrier molecules or coenzymes. Again, this is going to be elaborated in the next chapter, how that can be done. Like they are carriers of energy, okay? It's like, you know, if you have a battery, you can move energy from one place to the other. These guys can do that. And they are also used as specific signaling molecules in the cell. Uh, example, cyclic AMP. Again, this will be elaborated in a later chapter, all right, CAMP. All right. And the, the details will be discussed later in this course. I believe I have, yeah, I have almost finished this chapter just with this recap. So macromolecules found in cells contain a specific sequence of units sugars, amino acids, and nucleotides. These macromolecules are formed by condensation reactions where a new unit is added to a growing chain by the expulsion of a water molecule. I gave you examples of that, okay? Non-covalent bonds such as hydrogen bonds, hydrophobic forces make macromolecules assume specific shapes. I didn't discuss that in detail, but I kind of gave you the idea that many things are going to interact together, right, to form the final three-dimensional shape. And, and we will encounter this in the chapter on proteins. And these specific shapes, as well as the non-covalent bonds, allow macromolecules to seek out their appropriate partners and undergo the required reactions with them. So what I'm going to do is these last two slides, I will revisit them on Monday, all right, before moving on to the next chapter. Okay, how about that? And if you have any questions, let me know. All right. So the next chapter will get to one of your favorite topics about energy considerations, you know, which reactions are feasible and so on.